You're listening to the Scotiabank Market Points podcast. I'm your host, Greg White. Market Points is part of the Knowledge Capital series, a collection of audio, video, and written commentary from Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets leaders designed to provide you with timely insights and analysis. In Canada, the federal government continues to put the full weight of its financial powers into the fight against the economic turmoil caused by COVID-19. But have these programs performed as advertised in providing Canadians and Canadian businesses the support they desperately need? Effectiveness aside, the question remains, can we afford this? On this episode of Market Points, Rebecca Young, Director of Fiscal and Provincial Economics at Scotiabank, provides her perspective on Canada's financial position and sheds light on the question of affordability. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for being on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Big story out of Ottawa this week with the Canadian government extending the CERB program. Uh, What does the cumulative picture on the federal stimulus look like now? Well, the numbers keep getting big every day when we see a news uh, news release. And let's just start with the direct fiscal support that we're hearing from the federal government. So the number right now stands at about $160 billion, or 8% of GDP. And that's slightly half weighted towards households versus businesses. Uh, That grows to another $250 billion once you add on tax deferrals uh, that eventually have to be repaid. So you often hear the 12% GDP figure that's often cited about fiscal support. So that includes um, the direct support as well as these tax supports. The number gets even bigger, though, once you start talking about the uh, loans that are being offered to businesses and that are backed by crown corporations such as BDC and EDC. So that number really grows up to almost $330 billion in a whopping 16% of GDP. Now, I would just differentiate, though, that this is the fiscal support in response to COVID. The deficit numbers have another component that you add on to those numbers. So right now, what we're looking at in terms of deficit spending would be that targeted direct spend of $160 billion. But then you have to add on the revenue shock that government coffers can expect as a result of income losses from households and as well as profitability hits for corporations. So we put that at another $100 billion. So where the government stands now at the federal level is they will be coming in with a federal deficit of around 12% of GDP or about $260 billion this year and counting. So it still will grow as the year advances. When it comes to Canadian households and Canadian businesses uh, taking advantage of these programs that the government has put in place, what have you seen there just in terms of uh, utilization of the programs? It's certainly a mixed bag when we look at the utilization rates across different programs. So if we start with the household transfers, the bulk of it really is around income replacement or the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. So we definitely give that program gold stars for being up and ready pretty quickly at the onset of the crises. And so what we've actually seen now is that that the amounts and the claims have surpassed original expectations. And we saw earlier this week, in fact, that they plan to extend that program. So I think it was very targeted at income losses, which is one of the biggest impacts so far of the crises. Uh, But if we then turn to the business side of things, it's really a different story. So the uptake there versus households where we expect them to surpass what they've committed we see a very low uptake on business transfers so far. And so if we look at the targeted transfers, namely the wage subsidy for businesses and commercial rent, is we would put uptake below 10% right now on what's being committed in in those regards. And so I think it is multifaceted in terms of um, you know, what is going on there, that certainly there's a complexity of design and eligibility that's prevented businesses from taking up some of these transfers. I think it's also there's a degree of uncertainty of just how long the um, shutdown would have lasted. Now we're starting to see reopening, so we're getting more clarity on timelines. But certainly for business planning purposes, it makes it really difficult to make those decisions as to is this a temporary shutdown and we, you know, we stay in location and we keep employees on? Or are we looking at a many month shutdown, in which case 
the calculations change. Because remember, this is a 75% wage subsidy, so businesses still do have a 25% to cover on top of their other costs of doing business against a backdrop of having a, a sharp reduction in revenue losses. So all that to say that on the business side of things, the uptake has been relatively low so far. But going forward, we should see more uptake of the wage subsidy as we see businesses reopening. And so across the country, for the most part, with the exception of a few uh, areas, we see um, businesses opening and rehiring should start accelerating. And we've seen that already in Quebec in last month's data. What we do want to see, though, is not only an uptake of this wage subsidy, but we should see um, a reduction in the uptake of the emergency um, income replacement for households. So we, we want to see a transition from uh, households needing income replacement to actually taking up jobs in the private sector. So with the low utilization on the business side, does that say anything about the effectiveness of the of the programs? Absolutely. I think the low utilization means those monies aren't in the economy. They aren't providing the bridge, uh, let alone the support that they should be having in such a severe downturn. So I think we really do want to see this money, this support getting to the business sector one way or another, that we certainly know the need is out there. And so we've seen surveys, for example, by Statistics Canada that shows that a third of businesses expect revenue losses of, of more than 40% in the first quarter. And that was really at the onset of the shutdown. So revenue losses are going to be very big. And the um, ability to cash manage, particularly for small and medium-sized uh, businesses in Canada, is fairly low. And so I think that we do see um, the need there. We've just, we need some recalibration of the tools. And we do see the federal government attempting to adapt some of these programs uh, to, to support the business community. And I think for the most part, uh, a number of the programs targeting uh, the business community have been focused more on liquidity. So they haven't necessarily been um, heavily weighted towards transfers that don't have to be paid back. And so for some businesses, the longer the recovery takes and the less of a rebound that some sectors may face, uh, it becomes more of a solvency issue and not so much a liquidity issue. And so they will be hesitant to take on more debt to bridge these times if they're not convinced that there is a strong rebound on the other side. So the government support in those types of cases can be relatively limited if it does need to be repaid. On the demand side, if we're supporting households with income uh, in which the intent is to spend it, is there a risk that... Uh, several households will not spend those dollars and instead uh, opt to save those dollars? Absolutely. And so one of the uh, reasons I would give uh, high marks for the CERB, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit so far, is that it was not only quick out the door, but it was targeted at those who had lost their jobs or at least lost significant income. And so we would say those categories would have a high propensity to spend at least once shops reopened. And so in that sense, it was um, it was well targeted on, on those that need it. But the longer that sort of support goes on as the economy starts reopening, um, it does risk government support risks crowding out private sector and it does risk going to households that that don't actually need it and don't spend it and hence don't support the recovery. So I think that what we really need to look for as we enter this next phase of this unprecedented crisis is a different mix of policy tools um, in the fiscal space that, that shift from bridging households to investments that, you know, not only spark um, uh, temporary demand, but also enhance the productivity of the economy over the sort of the two, three, five-year time frame so that these are investments that will unlock stronger growth. So not just stimulate short-term demand that we need urgently in the next sort of six to 12 months, but also that longer term growth um, over the medium term. With all this activity around uh, employment insurance and the CERB program, is this essentially leading us towards a guaranteed basic income scenario? 
Well, the pandemic has certainly laid bare the weaknesses of our current employment insurance program, and, and this is notably the gaps of the working Canadians that are were not covered under the EI program. So that includes those in the gig economy, those self-employed, for example. What we know about that program is that typically close to 2 million Canadians tapped it, and the cost was on average about $2 billion a year, and that was self-financed through payroll taxes, basically. In contrast, what we see now with the CERB is that over 8 million Canadians are tapping it, and the price tag is over $17 billion per month, not per year. So we're clearly not in normal times, though, so it's not fair to extrapolate and say that um, something approaching a guaranteed basic income would be that costly, but the numbers would still be high. So the Parliamentary Budgetary Officer uh, two years ago, costed such a program around $45 billion a year for Canadians. So that still is, um, from a financial sustainability perspective, um, a very steep price tag. And so certainly um, at this point, um, you know, certainly is unaffordable for Canada. But that's not to say that there isn't room for improvement. And for one, certainly there is um, a lot of ways to streamline and simplify our social safety nets that really um, you know, deliver better outcomes for those that really need this type of support. But I think importantly in this crisis, that employment will continue to dominate the recovery trajectory and basically how steep, how steep is that rebound or how strong is that recovery. And we really are unfortunately looking at a, a multi-year recovery that we see GDP levels attaining pre-crisis levels only by 2022 at the earliest. And so consequently, unemployment, though it will start to come down, uh, it will still end the year likely above 10% um, in our Scotiabank forecast. So it will continue to weigh on the recovery. And so the key for government policy really is providing that right balance as a provide support to the economy? How do they provide the incentives to work, including training for dislocated workers, while also recognizing that legitimate need for income replacement for some parts of the population that will continue to be affected by this longer-term recovery? And so I would say that's neither the old EI, nor is it the full-blown CERB that we're looking at today. And so it's really a space that we need to watch as to how the government really does fine-tune these support programs in the next phase. As temporary as those CERB numbers may be, they're still quite large and, of course, coupled with all of the rest of the package. Uh, What is this doing to Canadian debt levels? Well, no doubt all of this spending is going to boost Canada's government debt levels. So whereas the federal government had targeted a debt ratio um, as a share of its economy to around 30% as recently as December, we're likely to see that net debt level shooting up closer to 50% of GDP. So it is a very big step change. And it's not just the feds that are spending, it's also provinces. And so when we look at international comparisons, we typically look at that general government debt level that includes all levels of government for comparability. So when we do, in fact, look at Canada's general government debt levels on a net basis, we actually did enter this crisis Uh, as the the, the lowest levels among G7 peers. And so at that, you know, the level specifically is, was 26% last year, and that's likely to go up to about 40% next year. And just to put it into context, the US, for example, is expected to see its net debt approach 110% of GDP relative to Canada's 40%, and Japan's will surge to 170%. So Canada's net debt suddenly looks um, far more palatable when you put it in those types of terms. I would caveat, though, that I'm referencing net debt. So that's once you net out the assets that the government holds against this debt, because on gross debt terms, Canada is more middle of the pack. And it's actually unique among its peers in that we do have well-funded pension plans that give us this net debt advantage over the medium term. But over the short term, we really can't liquidate that type of uh, financing or that type of asset in a crisis. But all this to say rating agencies for now should look favorably on Canada or at least neutrally. Um, You know, they expect this spending across the board from all countries in response to such a crisis. 
They recognize that this type of spending really is to prevent a far worse economic outcome, which would have had longer term effects. And Canada entered in uh, this crisis in a more favorable position. I think going forward, though, that rating agencies will look not just at Canada, but other countries as well as to what is the plan post recovery to start reining in those debt levels. So what is that path to consolidation? And are there credible steps or credible signs they are seeing that the government is committed to implementing those changes? The relative strength of Canada's financial position is certainly a a positive thing, uh, but stripping everything away, uh, can we afford these programs? I think actually the better question is, could we have afforded not to spend? And the quantums are no doubt big that we're talking about right now, but they are having an impact and will continue to have an impact on putting a floor under the decline and starting to really support or underpin that recovery. So basically, you know, they have and they will have an effect on preventing a far worse economic outcome. So had government spent less, we would have had a more prolonged recovery. We would have had growth potential eroding over time as unemployment became chronic and businesses were underinvesting persistently over several years. Because you recall that debt is measured as a share of GDP. So it's driven not only by debt as a numerator, but also as the strength of the growth or GDP as the denominator. So we could have very well found ourselves in a situation where debt as a share of the economy was in a far worse place and on a worse trajectory five years from now had the government not spent as it did uh, this year. And I would just note also that low interest rates play into our favor over the long run as well, that interest rates now are roughly an order of magnitude smaller than they were during the 90s in the so-called debt crises. And that's not to say that we can be complacent We'll definitely need to see concerted efforts to put debt on a sustainable trajectory over the medium term. And we'll also want to focus not just on the quantity of the spend, but also on the quality of the spend and how it really is underpinning stronger growth over that medium term. And so, you know, ultimately, just to finish, we really do want to see more ambition in the use of Canada's coveted fiscal firepower to unlock that stronger growth over the long term. That was Rebecca Young, Director of Fiscal and Provincial Economics at Scotiabank. You can find more thought-leading content from Scotiabank on our website at gbm.scotiabank.com. And you can also follow us on Twitter at ScotiabankGBM, as well as our LinkedIn showcase page under Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets. Please refer to our legal disclosures on our website. Thanks for listening.